Ooh, that's new. Yeah, <laughs> that's a new thing. <laughs> That's new. Yeah, okay. and you you have to proactively agree to be recorded. Oh, okay. Well, what, what either that every or you, guest gets that mm -hmm, little thing pops up, or you yeah. can leave. Interesting. <laughs> oh, you have. So it won't stop so, us if somebody clicks a no. Then. Right. Well, I, they. It's yeah. If you hit no, then you probably exit. Yeah. Is my guess. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna let everyone in. Here we go. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Hi, Karen. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to our Monday program. We're very excited to welcome Victoria Lautman. Um, I have people coming in right now. Just a few reminders. Um, if you can remain on mute during the program, that would be helpful. Um, if you have a trouble with mute, I will mute you from here, so not to worry. And then all questions, uh, we'll have a Q&A after the program. Uh, if you can please put them into the chat, Phyllis Hansen will be the moderator today. Also, we are recording this program and it will be available to our members on our website in a few days. And then my final announcement, if your camera is not on and you want it to be on, please unmute yourself right now and, and I will help you. Uh, we will start in a few minutes. Uh, again, welcome back. Hi, Meredith. You see, I've learned how to do this now. <laughs> You are a pro, Thanks. Yvonne. I'm so proud. So, thank that you is awesome. So, thank you so much for your help. This is my third Zoom today. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. <laughs> you, that is excellent. The second one was wonderful from the LA Phil, the Crescendo, and they were playing um, very not well known women composers who were born in the 1800s. Some beautiful oh, wow. things. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, wow. So go ahead and help everybody else. I just want to thank you again. <laughs> you are off my list then. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'll put it back on mute. Excellent. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Welcome back again. Just a few reminders to remain on mute for our program today. And any questions, please put them into the Q&A. Phyllis Hansen. Our board director of programs will be moder moderating the chat and we will have time for questions after the program. We're still admitting people right now. Um, again, I've already given you the mute. I'm telling you that we are recording and it will be available to members on our website in a few days. And then finally, if your camera is not on and you want it to be on, we also want to see you. So you can unmute right now and I will, I will ask you uh, to start your video and help you out. So we will start in about, we're gonna give it one more minute. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Welcome back everybody. One last time, please remain on mute during the program. It helps with any background noises. We are recording this program. It will be available on our website for members in a few days. Any questions, please put them directly into the chat. And um, if anyone has any questions or problems with their camera, please let me know if you want to be seen. I'm here to help you. Um, so. Let me let Susan in, and then we I will pass it over to our president, Patty Lombard. Thanks, Meredith. Hello and welcome. My name is Patty Lombard, and it's my honor to serve as the 64th president of the eBell, and my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual program. For those of you who are new to the eBell, we are a women's club founded 126 years ago by a handful of women to educate women. Today, our mission has evolved to host social and cultural events that inspire and empower women. 
award scholarships to students and provide grants to charities that help at-risk women and children in the Los Angeles community. Just well, over a year ago, the pandemic mandated the closure of our historic Bo Wilshire Boulevard Clubhouse. Shortly thereafter, we pivoted all our programming and events online. Alas, I am only virtually in our lovely library, as you can see in the background. We are delighted you are here and welcome you to learn more about the eBell. New members are always welcome. And in fact, I hope we will get some new ones today. Our dues are very reasonable. You get access to these wonderful programs as part of the eBell community and you support our mission. You will find more information on how to get involved in the eBell in an email after the event. I'm super excited to introduce our board director, Phyllis Hansen, who along with her committee develops our fabulous roster of programs. This one is particularly wonderful since we live across the street from a fabulous Miller Sheets building. Phyllis is gonna get us started and then we'll, she'll get back on to close and give you a short preview of what's coming up next. Thanks. Welcome everyone. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces here and so many new ones. Um, I am excited about this program and I just wanted to tell you this is kind of a, how this all came about when we were, um, Several of us were congregated outside of the eBell one morning several months ago when we were doing a special project and just happened to start talking about the building across the street. And this, this whole program, uh, thanks to Susie Click Lewis, who is going to introduce um, our speaker today, uh, came up with this idea. And we're very grateful that this all just sort of happened. Um, generically. And so I was very excited to meet our speaker today myself this morning, and this is going to be good. Susie, <laughs> tell us about Victoria and introduce her, please. Well, I'm really excited to introduce my friend, Victoria Lautman. And I met her several years ago when she did a talk at the Fowler Museum um, to a company her photos that were on display there about Indian step wells. And I had been to India and seen two of those step wells. So I really wanted to know more because they're very um, uh, just fascinating. Um, and then I was also gonna meet some friends there who had been together um, to India and they were equally um, interested and we were gonna meet for lunch afterwards. So we were all just totally blown away with Victoria's passion for the subject and, um, and all the extensive research she had done on Indian step wells. Um, she researched the architectural and symbolic meaning of these ancient structures. And even a lot of people in India didn't know. She has ended up teaching a lot of people in India about their own step wells by going there um, at least nine times um, and seeing and learning more every time and then writing a book about it. And then um, we learned a lot in the lecture. So we asked her after she did her talk and her book signing to join us for lunch, which luckily she did join us. And we got to know her even more. I think after Mexican food and several margaritas, which <laughs> went way into the afternoon, we really had so much fun. We just almost couldn't quit talking. She's just such a lovely person to know. Um, and we learned that she had actually grown up in LA, but she went to Oxford to study um, archeology span and then the University of New Mexico for anthropology and then the George Washington University in Washington DC to get her master's in art history. Um, then she worked for the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum and Garden for four years before moving to Chicago and pursuing a career in journalism. So she spent the last three decades as a cultural journalist across all media, photography, writing, interviews, and lectures, focusing on art history, architecture, and literature. In Chicago, she founded, produced, and hosted interviews for its Chicago public television and radio stations, and was recognized as a major cultural voice for the city. Her articles have been published in many major publications, including Architectural Digest and many other prestigious 
uh, magazines. And the list is just too long to mention here, but go to her website and, and check it out. It's amazing. So after, um, so about three years ago, she came back to LA and we're so lucky to have her here. Um, and lately she's just become totally entranced by Millard Sheets and his art and career, his architecture, and those fabulous mosaic wall murals, which all of us have seen all over Southern California, especially in LA, and we love it. And so when she told me that she was investigating it, I got excited because I've always loved those myself. So I know she's the right person to tell us all about it. So tell us about it, Victoria. Thank you, Susie. Uh, thank you so much. And also thank you, Phyllis, for uh, asking me to do this and Meredith for trying to get me through some technical issues here. I'm going to share the screen and, uh, and I see this is Phyllis. Um, you guys, it's not doing it's, we want to yeah. not. Just I feel, close out the PowerPoint and then restart it and you'll be yeah, good to go. Sorry, you guys. I don't know why it happened again. Um, hold on a second. Yep. I have to escape out of this. I'm sorry, folks. Here we go. Now, yep. Now, yeah, you're good. Okay, ready, got ready it. for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to minimize myself. I won't be able to stand seeing myself. Okay, I'm sorry, we have had some uh, technical issues this morning. So, uh, because this is the very first time that I have done this talk and the notes that I thought I was gonna be using are not available. Uh, please remember that right now, I want one of those margaritas so badly that Susie and I had three years ago. Uh, anyway, moving, moving beyond that, I just need to, uh, Clear, okay, well, whatever. Hopefully you're not seeing any of this stuff that's showing up on my screen right now. We are, we're not, we okay. only see the image. You're good to go. Excellent. Uh, the Millard Sheets project was something that was really completely uh, born out of COVID. I mean, that was just the one little silver lining for me because I literally would not have started this project if we had not uh, been uh, going through this pandemic. When everything shut down, I was just about to start another project totally unrelated, having to do with India. Uh, and suddenly I was not able to uh, go to the Library of Congress. And I would have just gone crazy if I hadn't come up with something of interest to sink my teeth into during uh, the last year. And as it happened, yes, Millard Sheets was, um, somebody who had been on my mind for a couple of years. I had grown up in California, knew absolutely nothing. Everything that you hear today is something that I put in my head over the course, course of the last year, which, um, you know, thankfully there was plenty of empty space in my head and I could come up with something to fill it with. I did go to the Marciano Foundation at the time. This was of course the, uh, the, uh, it was built by Millard Sheets in 1961 as uh, part of the, of, sorry, as part of the um, Freemasonry. It's uh, at the time that they redid this for the Marciano Foundation, uh, they gutted the top floor to show all of the contemporary art there. And they built this wall that you see back here because what was behind it at the time was thought to be uh, distracting from the modern art that was on display. When you go behind that, which I hope a lot of you have, hopefully we'll be able to do this again if the, uh, the Gagosian Gallery takes it over, which is uh, one of the rumors going around about the building. But you would be confronted with this absolute, this stup stupendous floor to ceiling mosaic on the other side. I had never seen anything like that. It was this beautiful object uh, of animals in a forest. You can't even really get far enough back to take photographs of it. But I found it absolutely enchanting. And of course, the little label next to it indicated a person named Millard Sheets had, had designed it. I didn't know at that point that he had also designed the building. But uh, 
at the start, and then I sort of put it out of my mind. I mean, I went back and forth to the Marciano Foundation a number of times, but uh, then at the start of the pandemic, um, I decided, okay, I'm gonna start doing some more research on this. I was hoping I was gonna to get to do a talk at some point, I just didn't know. But it turned out at that point that when I started doing the research, the first thing I discovered is that there is a fantastic book specifically on the topic of Millard Sheets and the banks that he did for Howard Amundsen and home savings and loan, banking on beauty. Adam Aronson published this in 2017 and it really is, he went into so much detail and, and so much research went into this that it is the definitive book on the topic. But as most of you will know, Millard Sheets actually wasn't an architect and actually called himself an architectural designer, but began life and was largely known throughout his life and thought of himself as a painter, first, foremost, and always. Worked in a variety of media, also was a watercolorist, did everything that you could possibly do in two dimensions. Um, so there are a number of books that are available on the topic of Millard Sheets as an artist, but that's about it. There wasn't really anything to me that seemed to tie together all these different strands of his life and work. Oh, and by the way, um, he had four children and two of them, uh, Tony, who's an artist, and his daughter Caroline, um, provided really in-depth, uh, lovely, very personal essays for two of these books, uh, Damn Gorgeous, and I think large sheets, one man renaissance, these are all available uh, on, you know, on, on the web and Adam Aronson's book is still in print. The others are not, but there's a number of other resources that I found, two of which were really, really helpful. And those were actual oral histories with Millard Sheets, one from the UCLA uh, Digital Library, the other from the National Museum of American Art. So you could read those or listen to them and they really brought him alive to me in a way that, I don't know, maybe it was COVID related, I was trapped, you know, but I became so sort of engrossed in this man's life. And partly that was because his life encompassed so many different things at a time when we could not do anything, that maybe I was living vicariously through him. But when you listen to some of the, his recollections and read about all the various things he did, the man, he never said no to anything. Everything was yes, nothing was too small for him. And yet his vision was huge. The vision itself was basically one that we need to bring art to the masses. This is um, a thought, a romantic idea that goes back centuries, but he really espoused it, he lived it. And he was really, for a time, the most influential artist in California on the California system. And of course that rippled out exponentially beyond. So I became very captivated by his point of view. It wasn't even that I was that big a fan of his actual style or his artwork. It said I was a fan of his life and a fan of his epic vision. So when I started going around and Adam Aronson, when you, I, I can talk about this later offline, but there is a grid you can follow that has like every project that he thinks existed ever, a lot of them don't anymore, that Millard Sheets did. I started to try and find them, the ones that were accessible to me. And it brought me all over Southern California. It was like the perfect thing to be a single person driving around plotting my strategy every day, spending hours on the road in my car, going and looking up Millard Sheets projects. And I realized at that time that, yes, there were the projects we're all familiar with, the banks, you know, the paintings, but he was really embedded in the background um, of LA art and California life. Um, there's remnants and bits and pieces of it everywhere hiding in plain sight, which is very much I found was appealing to me in the same way that um, the Stepwells did in India. The idea that we have access to things which are there if we really look to find them. For instance, this crazy weird horse and rider from 19 um, is actually something that is covering up my screen, 
showing the, uh, the exact date of this. I think it's 1957, but I mean, really the technology gods are against me today. Uh, anyway, this is a, a corner that's within blocks of LAX that I must have driven by a thousand times in my life and never noticed that it was there. It was actually commissioned for a bank that's long gone, now just embedded in literally the surface of the building of IHOP. Nobody noticed it. I was taking pictures and people were looking at me like, are you crazy? I love the juxtaposition here of this man's arm and this ad behind it. Um, or another one that's embedded in California. This is a huge mosaic that was commissioned for the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in 1971 on what was thought to be the actual Camino Real, the street that allegedly that did, there was this, this, this route did exist, the Camino Real, which linked um, all of the missions in California all the way down to Mexico um, that you could travel along to get to all the missions. Whether that actually went through Beverly Hills, I can find no record of it. Possibly it exists. But in any case, it was installed in the Port Cochere where cars and taxis would drive up to the hotel and then was removed in 1987 and then reinstalled. It was stored off site, reinstalled in 2013, where you can go and now see it hanging over the garage for the Beverly Hills Civic Center. It's right there. Um, people driving in and out all day long. But then going further down the rabbit hole of Millard Sheets, I just realized that nothing was too big or too small for that man to design. The second seal that was ever used for the County of Los Angeles and was in use for 50 years, he designed that. Then it turns out I saw a reference to him signing with Columbia Pictures in the 50s for a little while when he became um, a designer, a set designer, and went scouting locations all over the Mideast for this, I never saw it slightly, this, this is the most salacious of the different um, ads for it. There's a number, but I like, it looks like he's getting ready to massage her. Uh, anyway, he, he talks about like just driving around Jordan and Israel and uh, all over the Mideast trying to find places to go and film this, this movie. Or even, um, he just made a passing reference once to the co-eds at Scripps where he uh, you know, was associated for decades, were unhappy with the, the garb that they had to wear to um, graduate. And so he changed it to this lovely green color, which is still in use today. He just did everything. So that coupled with this man's personal history, which is kind of like an uh, embodiment of the American dream in a way. He was born in 1907 in the Pomona Valley, which at the time was really a very bucolic uh, rural place. And in fact, his mother died two weeks after he was born and his father gave him to be raised to his uh, maternal grandparents. Um, and it, it was wonderful. He had an idyllic childhood Surround. He lived, grew up on a farm on the, a bit his grandparents owned um, on a ranch, had ponies from an early age, but also as, had, was very early apparently um, showed talent for art and it was encouraged. You know, that was an important thing. Don't drive it out of the kid, encourage him. And this is actually a photograph of him from his early teens. You can see even from age like five, he was apparently drawing. Now, one of the other things that I realized from this age um, on in Millard Sheets' life, maybe even before that, maybe being given over to his grandparents, he, it was like, if you believe in destiny or karma or guardian angels, any of those things, this man had them. He had people stepping into his life all through it at different points who were like his mentors and getting him to the next stage of his life. Um, so that the first one of these really is that he notices some neighbor near them, a woman who was painting in her living room at night. And he was kind of peering in the window like a creepy young stalker. And she notices that, <laughs> invites him in and starts weekly teaching him how to uh, mix paints and how to copy art 
from you know great works at the time. That was his first real art mentor who got him on the road to painting. And at something like age 12, he enters one of these copies into an art fair, an art show at the, at that point, very young um, LA County Fair in Pomona. It was the Pomona County Fair at that time. Uh, and he wins a prize in the category of copied paintings. The man running the exhibitions then, whose name is Theodore Modra, hands him his prize, I don't know what it was, but says, listen, never copy any other art again. This man was an artist himself. Start coming to my house and I will teach you how to paint. So very quickly had people stepping in and um, helping him along the path. Uh, and, he, and he just kept doing that. Um, when he graduated from high school, he could have gone to Pomona College on a scholarship, but instead he takes a look at what is the Schwinnard Art Academy in Los Angeles, like many hours away from him and decides he's not gonna go to college, he's gonna go to art school. And that's what he does. And very quickly, he starts absorbing every kind of art style you could, every time of a type of medium that you can imagine. He just sort of drew it all into him. And somebody recommended that he try watercolors. At that point, he had just been doing painting and he really took to this medium and very early on was considered a master of the watercolor medium and became associated with the uh, California Watercolor Society. It's a very young member, later uh, chaired it. And actually he talks about how it costs something like, I don't know, $150 or something a year to go to the Schwinnard Art School. And uh, in his, and he was in order to pay for that, he would get up early on the farm, help his cousin trap and skin rabbits, sell them, and that helped defray the costs of him going to school. But while he was a second year student, he was so good at watercolor that they asked him to actually teach. So he was this second year student also teaching and getting paid by the school, by Schwinnard. Now, at that time, um, you know, really, he, he was a California re regionalist, an American regionalist painter. These were artists who were turning away from the grand topics in Europe and literally looking at the scenes around them. Um, in, in Millard's case, it was farm life. It was his rural scenery. You see it over and over in his canvases, in his art, all his life. You know, the, he had this love of horses that always appeared. He later raised them um, himself uh, behind his home. And just the bucolic scenes of where he grew up or farm life. And these were the scenes that he became to be known for. That's what he knew. But while he was in his third year of school, he ventured a little bit further along. He heard that there was a uh, gypsy encampment not far from Pomona. There was something like 2,000 gypsies from around the country who were camping there to elect their queen. So he skipped school for a week, later explaining why he did it. And they were like, okay, that's cool. You can do that. And he set up his own camp there to paint these people. And he talked about, you know, this is a sheltered farm kid, suddenly surrounded by what he said. They looked really tough and scary to him, but he said they were kind of weird at first about it, but ultimately they saw what he was doing. They respected him and they left him alone. But this desire to, to move outside his comfort zone and really this adventure and spirit of his, it was with him his entire life. Um, you know, the art that he was doing, and he just uh, was making art all the time. It was just obviously in his blood, but he was not known as somebody who was pushing the limits of art um, in terms of subject matter. He was always very formal in it. Um, he always was interested in composition. Even in during the de depression, he was never um, showing the downtrodden, the poor, the, the hungry. He was looking at things um, in a pleasing way. And this was something that some people used as a criticism against him later on in his life. But at this time in his life, when he's young, he's just like in his early 20s, he was considered a very, very fine and important painter and began um, getting prizes and winning awards everywhere. Um, he graduated from Schwinnard in 1929 and a couple important things happened all at once. 
He's approached by the Dalziel Haskell Gallery, Hatfield, Dalziel Hatfield Gallery, which was the preeminent gallery on the West Coast showing important modern and um, uh, art from the 19th century. That's where he would go and actually look at Van Gogh and other artists of that ilk. And they said, we'll take you on. We think you have talent. And it ended up being like a 45-year a connection. And they sold something like 3,600 paintings of his over the years. That was number one. I mean, to, to be graduating from school at age 22, have your first exhibition. And at the same time, he had entered work and he was constantly sending work off all over the country to different competitions. He won second prize in a show in Texas with a painting called um, Goat Farm. <laughs> I wanted to commit that one. He won with Goat Farm and he won like $1,700, which was huge um, for this farm kid. And he decides he's gonna go to Europe for six months, which was a smart thing, except that right before he left, he meets his soulmate. This is Mary Baskerville, Bill Baskerville, who was a student herself, an art student at UCLA, and they were quite the hot couple. He was kind of dreamy and she was beautiful and that was his soulmate, but they both decided he still had to go to Europe, go and see the art of Europe. And he proposed to her two weeks after they met. Uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, he, takes a steamer, what he calls a banana boat, from uh, California down through the Panama Canal, stopping at 17 um, cities along the way in South America until he reaches Manhattan. Uh, and he's just painting, painting, painting the whole time. When he gets to Manhattan, he, again, he is such a uh, charismatic character he just draws people to him everywhere. And he made very important connections there. One person who says, when you come back, call me because I can get you published. Uh, and also begins to, um, this one person, I, I forget actually, he was an architect who had said, while you're there, make sure you do a lot of architectural drawings. Now, Miller Cheats at that point, had learned how to do architectural renderings. He traded with some architects who he was teaching how to do etchings when he was at Chouinard and they taught him how to do architectural rendering. So he created a number of sketchbooks while he traveled all around Europe and took really copious notes and sketches. Beautiful, you can see at 22 what he was doing. Um, he goes everywhere, makes very important connections, learns how to do lithography with a guy who is working with Matisse. I mean, it's just sort of an incredible journey that he took. And also meanwhile, discovers it in Paris the Salon d'Automne, the Autumn Salon, which is very famous, is going to have their next exhibition. So he quickly paints this painting based on one of the stops on the trip over in a town in Guatemala and submits it to this Parisian salon and it's accepted, which is a very, very big deal. You can see this kind of flattened form. It's modern, but it's not, there's nothing earth shattering about it, but it's a very, very lively kind of uh, composition. So when Millard Sheets gets back to Manhattan after all of that, he immediately has a lot of his work that all of these sketches published in two different magazines. Meanwhile, his work has been selling out in California at the Dalziel Gallery. Um, I forget where I read a bunch of the letters that he was writing to, um, to Mary at that time, but they're just the most adorable, loving, excited, like at the brink of this incredible life. And again, remember, this was all in COVID, so I'm probably spinning this totally out of control. But it was just such an amazing journey to have been part of at that point, like through all of these um, different ways that he was recording it. And then when he comes back to California, he is very quickly offered a job at Scripps College in Claremont um, as a teacher, which in turn very quickly turned into uh, a job putting together their art department, which he actually founded, not just as a teacher, but he actually expands it. At the time, um, he starts going back to painting full time, um, you know, again. And this was during the New Deal when the Works Project Administration uh, kicked off, and he became 
the uh, on the committee in Southern California for the local pro uh, works project, the arts, the arts part of that. Um, I forget what it's called and the public works of art project. That's right. Uh, sorry, excuse me here a second while I move that note. Uh, and he actually ends up uh, donating the this one on the right tenement flats uh, to that group, to the Works Project Administration. It goes on view in the White House. Roosevelt sees it every day. And this is how it ends up in the National Museum of American Art. And it's interesting, these two were, which were among his two most famous paintings back then. The one on the left ends up at um, the LA County Museum, Angel's Flight. This is actually apparently a picture of his wife at that point, Mary. They get married five months after he returns, by the way. And soon he has one of four kids. Uh, these are two different views of Mary. She's at the top of Angel's Flight, which I'm sure most of you in LA are, aware of and that for those of you not in LA, it's a funicular that goes from the um, up this hill, Bunker Hill at the top of the hill, you can see on the right um, are these very fancy houses, which are fancy, sort of uh, Victorian homes built at the top. So you're seeing this from two different angles at the top looking down and the bottom looking up. At that point, he was considered really incredibly, um, he had national importance. He was in the Carnegie, international. Uh, they had never even accepted an artist like West of the Rockies. Uh, he was in something like 17 different museums at that point. And he was quite young on his way and doing incredibly well. Now it's Scripps. As I said, he was hired first to teach, then he founded the art department, then he went on to create a graduate school of art and um, was there for really, you know, 25 years almost. And it was this is Seal Court on the right at Scripps where the students and teachers would all congregate after class. Um, and just to digress a minute, when I, I, I spent maybe I went down to, to Pomona and uh, Claremont four or five times in the last year just going and looking at these places that I was reading about. It is the most lovely place to spend time. And uh, there's, there's so much they're still, that Sheets did himself. I'm not showing a lot of those photographs. I just don't have time for everything here. But if you're interested in this period of time when he, particularly after the war, during the, um, what was it, the GI Bill in the 40s, there was this huge influx of older students to Claremont. And meanwhile, Sheets is beefing up these art departments, hiring um, ceramic artists and textile artists and people who did all different types of art in all different media, he saw no distinction between any of them. This was one of his brilliant visions, I think, is that he saw them all as interrelated, no disparity if you were crafts or fine arts, it was all the same to him. And that period in the 40s was just magical. Um, these are two videos which you can actually watch on YouTube. I can tell you about you know, how to get them later if you don't remember what these are. I actually bought them from the Claremont Historical Society, which is amazing. Uh, and it talks about this period, like what Millard Sheets did for Claremont and then the architecture that was built at that time. Absolutely fascinating, made me totally jealous, wanted to be part of it. So, um, He's, he's doing, he's teaching there and he's doing a lot of painting and murals on the side, but something else happens then in the early thirties as his career is taking off. Theodore Modra, that early um, mentor of his from when he submitted and won that prize at age like 12 to the LA County Fair, he dies. And the director of art exhibitions is given, offered to, who accepts, Millard Sheets. Uh, at the time, this sort of crummy but interesting picture, I think, the LA County Fair, which started in the 20s, um, was one of the largest fairs, if not the largest fair in the country. It's like a million people would go there every year when it was staged in Pomona. And when Millard Sheets took it over, I mean, for a time it was during the war, it was closed, it was an internment camp for Japanese at one point. Uh, but before that, he used WPA money to expand, like double or triple the size of the, uh, 
the art exhibition pavilion. So it was just huge, like 20,000 square feet. And I'm just gonna digress. They named it after him um, in something like 93, I think. I tried to go there. This is not my photograph, but it was actually a vaccination site when I drove. I mean, a lot of the places I tried to get into were closed, but a lot of them, like the banks are open. I'm just gonna go forward in time a little bit now because what Millard Sheets then added to his quiver of all of the different talents he had in the 50s, he became like a curator par excellence. I think, and I love county fairs. I will go to any county fair anywhere, but I don't associate them with fine arts. I associate them with people making landscapes out of dried beans and 4-H club, but I don't think of Whistler and Delacroix and Matisse. He organized exhibitions there that, you know, were not even being offered in the museums of the time and convinced places like, look, the Metropolitan Museum, Museum of Fine Arts. Later on, the Louvre was contributing work to exhibitions that he did and showing world-class art, incredibly valuable, important art to the masses at probably the most popular venue that existed in the state. So in that sense, he really realized his vision of getting art in front of the people. At one point, he, um, he organized something called 6,000 Years of Ceramic Art. That was, but it was very hard for me to find any reference material. I ordered this from Abe Books, this catalog. I was happy to find it just to see the art that was included in that show. And another one that was just incredible was a um, collaboration he did, The Arts of Daily Living. This was with um, House Beautiful and the very, uh, the, she was a really important and influential editor there, Elizabeth Gordon. Uh, in 1954, I cannot find a back issue of this magazine, so I'm sorry about these crummy photographs, but they collaborated on this. This was really a signal event for mid-century modern design. And I mean, yes, by that time um, he had been doing, uh, you know, more work in design, but he hadn't done any of these major architectural things yet that he came to be known for. They created 22 showrooms on the site of the county fair that represented the best of the best in design, in art, in crafts. He brought together all of these people and artisans and folks that he had worked with at that point through the years when he was on the, um, the WPA commission in Southern California, he was handing out jobs to all of these artists. So here was another way for him to help these people and turn around and be a mentor himself. Um, this is a um, Sam Maloof chair in the background. I looked that chair up, it sold at auction not long ago for tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, this represented the creme de la creme at that time at the LA County Fair. Okay, so I just went forward a bit. To go back to what was happening in the 30s after he goes to Scripps and he's, he's painting murals uh, for lots of stores, Bullock's Wilshire, for instance, and a number of other uh, big stores and for personal private homes in California. This was all leading up to, uh, to the war, to World War II. And he got a call from a contractor that he knew in 1939. It turns out that America was getting, was on the brink of getting into the war and they needed very quickly to train uh, fighter pilots. And they didn't have enough places to do that. So this contractor called Millard Sheets because he had been contacted by somebody in the Air Force and needed help with this. And Millard Sheets takes over the design of this flight training academy, the first one, Cal Aero in um, Oxnard. And um, he had not done a public building before. I mean, remember, this fellow's not an architect, but he creates the design and not just that, but the furniture, the light fixtures, and even paints the walls in this place, brings it in way under budget in under three months and is immediately given a commission for 17 more of these flight training schools. 
in, a, in California, in Arizona, in Texas, they were like all around, they weren't just in California, including this one, um, Thunderbird One, he did a number of these in Arizona. This one is my personal favorite for a number of reasons, but chiefly because it looks like a Thunderbird. He designed it to look like there are the wings, here's the tail feather, and here at the end is the control tower. This was a place where um, officers were sent to flight school from England, America, China, Canada. And now it's part of the ASU system. It's a global training, just, just the, uh, that one part exists. Although a number of the other ones that he did around the country became actual airports after that. But there was also during the war, the Thunderbirds uh, movie came out, which was all based on what that particular place, naming it Thunderbird. And I only just found out um, some of you might remember this, in the mid 60s, a British TV series comes out called Thunderbirds Are Go. Um, there was a terrible remake of it not long ago, but this I remember watching in California, growing up out in the valley. Uh, it was created in England. Why does that happen? Because a British pilot is stationed there, a captain's learning how to do all this stuff goes back to England, tells his younger brother about it. The brother grows up and becomes a TV writer in England and they create Thunderbirds Are Go with this system of marionettes that when I read about it, I'm still, I'm getting goosebumps. It's like, oh my God, I remember that. It was super cool. And it all has to do with Millard Sheets. But so the war, we get into the war. Millard Sheets at that point was in his mid thirties and he had four children, sole support of the family. He could have been deferred, but he felt very more from a moral standpoint that he needed to join the war effort. And he does that in a really unusual way. He uh, joins as a civilian artist war correspondent in a joint collaboration between the Air Force and Life magazine. I didn't realize this was a thing. There were probably about a hundred of them, artists. Most of them were enlisted men already. There were only like 20, 25 who actually were civilians. And there's a documentary that exists about this, which I haven't found yet. I only um, noticed that it exists and it's called They Drew Fire, Combat Artists of World War II. Some of them died. This is another period of Millard Sheets' life, which was just, I mean, I was so gripped reading the description of this in his um, oral history that I was just thinking, this is like a movie. How can this happen? So he joins. He thinks he's going to be gone for a month. He's gone for 10 months. In fact, when he gets back, his youngest child says to his mom, when is that man going to leave? The kids don't recognize him. He's gone for a long time and it's harrowing. The two month trip from San Pedro to Calcutta is just fraught. It's, you know, they could have, they were afraid they were gonna get bombed or torpedoed. The captain is out of control drunk. Terrible things are happening on board. Millard Sheets is painting like the ceilings and the dining hall and stuff. It takes him two months to get to Calcutta. And when he gets there, he arrives and, and he chose India and Burma theater of war, they call it, because he had read stories as a kid about those areas and that's where he wanted to be stationed. I don't think he realized what he was getting into. He couldn't possibly have. Um, when he landed after this terrible voyage um, and he leaves his hotel room just to walk around, he said within just a few blocks he had encountered over a dozen dead bodies. It was the worst famine in India, a million people died during that time, just of the famine. And um, this is a kid from the farm. I mean, he had had a charmed life up until then. Now he wanted to go and he felt committed to seeing the war and, and he did end up seeing it, but only because in another twist of fate, he was seated at a dinner party next to uh, General Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten at that point, who said, oh, you know, uh, have you been getting what you want as an artist here? And he said, no, I haven't gotten to go to the front. That's what I really want to do. And so Mountbatten arranges for Millard Sheets to go to the front in Burma where they are fighting. And he 
cheats death several times on that trip, according to what he talks about. And this dead tank captain, that's an actual thing that happened. People right in front of him being blown up. He barely got out of there with his life. And uh, before he came back from there, he was about to take a trip to China where another front had was, he wanted to take this trip to China to see what was happening there and ran into another friend of his there who said, please Millard, I'm leaving town soon and I have to go back to the States. I really want to go to China. Will you please let me go? And Millard didn't want to do that to switch seats with him, but he ended up making arrangements, very complicated to do it. This fellow goes in Millard Sheets' place and the plane crashes upon takeoff. So, I mean, this was a really dark, dark period in his life. And he says that he never was able to complete a painting. It was so disturbing to him. They did publish some of the images in um, Life magazine. But I think that that had a profound effect on him when he came back. Uh, and there was only one reference in one of the books I read that he underwent a short depression. Well, you know, I can imagine, apparently his work became very dark at that time too, as you would imagine. But he does go back to um, his teaching, although in 1953, things change for him again. I mean, he takes a year off with his family and they all go to Hawaii, which was a very bucolic setting for him. But when he comes back, he leaves Scripps College where he's been for almost 25 years and has been offered the directorship of the Otis Art Institute. So again, the impact that he's making in Southern California then, is not just through all these other ancillary things. Um, as a teacher, but really shaping the lives of so many generations of artists that came after him with the tremendous ripple effect. But then the next phase of his life uh, starts in 1954 with Howard Amundsen. And um, Howard Amundsen was a financier at that point in Southern California. They did not know each other. They were similar ages uh, who had bought a home savings and loan uh, uh, group here in Southern California that became the home savings and loan that we associate with Howard Amundsen. Uh, and Amundsen had seen a photograph in the paper of this building on the left, which no longer exists, but um, Sheets decided that he wanted to work on these larger architectural projects. He was commissioned to do this building, doesn't exist anymore, but it got a lot of attention because of unusual use of materials. And uh, Howard Amundsen sends a letter to Millard Sheets that I have to read to you because no architect in the history of the world has ever received anything like this. He got it in 1953. Here it is. Have traveled Wilshire Boulevard for 25 years. No name of architecture, of architect and year, every building was built. Bored, have two valuable pieces of property, Wilshire Boulevard, need buildings designed, dot, dot, dot. If interested, call this number. He said it was like a telegram, but it was a letter written to him. And he and, he and Amundsen met, and Amundsen actually, commissioned, the first building was not home savings and loan. It was the National American Fire Insurance Building down on Wilshire Boulevard. And he said to Millard, design it as if you're designing it for himself, yourself. It's not about money. I want it to be beautiful. Just do what you want. And the descriptions that Millard Sheets has in his oral histories of meeting with Amundsen in this horrible, disgusting office and their bizarro relationship it's really fascinating, comical and crazy. But that's exactly what Millard Sheets does. He finally is able to like, almost like going back to what he did for Cal Arrow, just do whatever he wants, design a beautiful building with sculpture, with mosaics, with gold. He brings in, he does the landscaping. He puts in full growth trees. He designs every piece of furniture down to the ashtrays and even organizes a collection of antique fire trucks to install in Amundsen's office. Um, I, it's, 
the only really crummy photo that I could find of this, but just to give you an idea of what it looked like, it was really anachronistic. The idea of combining all of these things on the front of an insurance building was just unheard of. They were like storefronts, you know, boring storefronts. But when he completed it, and Amundsen famously walked around this thing and didn't say a word for like 45 minutes, and then finally sat down and looked at um, sheets and said, okay, now go build the other one. And the one thing I want to say about this is before sheets opened the ground up, before they began actually building this, he got cold feet. He was thinking, this is going to come in much higher. I don't know. It's going to be expensive. So he decides to call Amundsen up on the phone and gets him. He's like, you know, just wanted to check with you. We were about to break ground here. And do you think, you know, do you realize? And the line goes dead. And he call, calls back, gets the sector. And he said, the, the line went dead. Can you put it through? She said, it didn't go dead. He hung up on you. He said, just go ahead. Amundsen didn't want to be bothered with any of these details. He just wanted to build, have sheets build these beautiful buildings. They came in like way beyond the budget they were ever budgeted for, but it paid off. Now, he also said to Sheets that he wanted buildings that were going to still be exciting in 50 or 75 years. And unfortunately, this building didn't even make it to 15 because Amundsen decided 14 years later to knock it down and put up this, the um, Wilshire Colonnade by Edward Durrell Stone. And uh, <laughs> that's got to have hurt Millard Sheets. He did get a tiny consolation prize in that if you go into that Chase Bank there on uh, the first floor, there's a huge mural and a, uh, a little, but very pretty mosaic that you can see there. Sorry, I'm fighting. Can't even see these notes. Why am I bothering with this? Sorry, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, anyway, that's what's there now. Um, so when he started the other project, this was the first home savings and loan. It's just down the street, really, from where I live. I can walk there um, from my house. And it uh, is, I mean, you would call this sort of, it's a new formalist architecture. It became almost the blueprint for the savings and loan style. It looks like a fortress or some called it a mausoleum, solid blocky buildings. There was always um, you know, this grand entrance. And by the way, um, as far as them being chases, uh, I don't remember all the dates of this, but when it, it changed hands, the home savings and loan was bought out by another um, banking company. And then 2008 in the banking crisis, virtually overnight, they were all given to Chase to take over as the other place went um, belly up. And so you see a lot of these are Chase banks now, not all of them, they became other things too. But unfortunately, a lot of the home savings insignias, which in this case, you can just make out the outline of it here, that was taken away. And really what's changed is the inside. You just can't really comprehend what they looked like in their heyday. But this use of mosaic and stained glass and tiles and sculpture, and gold, I mean, this was something that people were used to seeing in a temple or a church, uh, not in a bank, not in a savings and loan. And it's funny, this first one, you really have to go and look at these closely. This was the first one of these that, he, that Millard Sheets did for um, this environment. And he really didn't know that much about mosaic at that time. He had traveled and he admired it and he had a lot of friends um, who were doing it. He did the designs for these, but you can see it's not like making a painting. It, this, this, there's just too much going on in this. They didn't actually reverse it the way it was supposed to be reversed. And even his signature here, he sort of plays with that all through his um, career. And he, he puts his assistance in that. That was like, I think the first and last time that ever happened. Um, there was later a lot of kind of push and pull about who actually got credit for these, for making them, but it's always Millard Sheets from this point on. But then these details of H, S, and L, putting that right into the tiles, sculptures by Renzo Finci that were carried out in Italy. Um, you know, this was a real gamble to do this for, uh, for Amundsen, but 
he had a home savings and loan branch across the street that had been there for nine years. And when this opened, there were lines down the block for people to come in and deposit their money there. And they got something like $19 million in a month. He said that it paid for itself in two weeks. And when they asked people, why are you depositing your money here? Almost to a person said, I want my money to be somewhere beautiful. Like this really worked to show people they wanted to be associated with it. So it's a pattern he continued. For 25 years, they worked together. They did something like 50 of these together. And then after Millard and Sheets retired, it continued without him. Stained glass at that time, these were um, panels about the early history of money and banking from Babylon and up to the Bank of England. We never see any of these uh, etched glass panels again, but you, it's really hard to see this. And I had to sneak upstairs there because they created a second floor. Uh, but it was so successful that even just down the street, like literally three blocks away is the Amundsen Bank and Trust, which at the time, well, now it's a Chabad, they're, they're changing it into a um, Hasidic center that's done a fantastic job of conservation and restoration. But this, this was kind of an elevated version of just the same as in, in loan. And you can see just in that period of time and years, how far they've come with these, these um, mosaics, which are far more legible now. And there's some beautiful uh, cast stone screens on the side, beautiful mosaics on the inside. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna go really fast. Um, Sheets now, he's been working out of a barn on his property in Claremont and he now sets up his own studio, Millard Sheets studio in Claremont, which is now a very friendly optometrist, optometrist's office where um, you know they, they've really done a great job of preserving the place, including the sign. These original buildings over here, the tall one was the mosaic studio and this gorgeous garden of exotic plants. It's really a lovely place. This photograph of the interior that of furniture that uh, Millard Sheets designed, the beautiful wall and the cork, and all around it, very playful mosaics. And they let me into the former mosaic studio with the uh, this scaffold, very active. Like there were 25 to 30 people working in that property on these things from engineers and architects and mosaic artists. And I have a long list of the names of the artists that helped them. I'm just not gonna take time to go through that because, but Susan Hertel was, who I believe this is, she was like his right-hand person in, from the beginning, was a student of his uh, at, uh, scripts and then stayed with him and actually took it over with Dennis O'Connor when he retired. You can spend a day just plotting out, going and looking at these different Chase banks throughout. I mean, I, I must have been to, I don't know, 25, 30 different ones of these around, more than that, from San Diego and Long Beach. You can go to and, and, and other projects of his and airports and all over, but the banks are always available to you. Unfortunately, when Chase took them over, and, you know, you get things like this with, <laughs> I mean, sometimes it just goes right through a uh, mosaic. Um, there's one of those in, on uh, West Adams, I think. But just to go and look at the mosaics and the sculpture, and this, this is one of my favorite mosaics here. He, there was nothing, later they became more themed to the particular area, but you see a lot of horses and riders, just a beautiful theme that he always liked. It was incredibly complicated making these full scale, uh, and this isn't even a very large one, making these mosaics. You had to do the drawing first, the painting, then you had to blow it up into a large full scale on the wall, then you had to take it down and put it on the floor, and then it was just an incredibly complex process that nobody enjoyed, including his son, Tony, who was forced to do it for a summer and said it was just the most tedious work ever. When Sheets got this commission in 1961, he actually tried to, David Underwood was the architect. By that time, he needed to have architects signing off on his designs. This was serious, big architecture. And you couldn't just be an architectural designer. Um, that's true today too, but he insisted that these designs were all his and he was always the front man for, uh, for these meetings. In fact, he was rarely in the studio except to sign off on 
finished products. And um, one of the people, one of the interviews I read said that one of the one of his artists came in and had trained their parrot to say, where's Millard, where's Millard, where's Millard? And they just had this parrot in the studio all the time. I'm not sure how he felt about that. When he was approached by, uh, by uh, the Freemasons to do the Scottish Rite Temple, that's a degree of the Freemasons. Um, and actually that double-headed eagle is their insignia. Uh, he tried to talk them out of it. He thought it was a crazy idea. He's like, why do you need a temple that big? They wanted um, a theater for 3000 people and a dining room for 1500. And he just could not understand it. But he finally went along with it and said that it was the most exciting project that he had worked on. He brought in other artists that he knew and had hired at Scripps, um, Albert Stewart, who did the designs for those sculptures, uh, which represented important people from the history of Freemasonry all through time. And in fact, this huge mural, it was the largest um, mosaic mural that they had done to date, um, also had scenes from history of masonry in much the way that you would if you went into a medieval church uh, for people who were illiterate. Um, they would recognize scenes from the Bible based on the stained glass that they saw. And that's very much the same with these beautiful scenes that he created. And then just a couple of years later, he was uh, commissioned to do one in San Francisco. I have not been there to see this, but you can recognize that double-headed eagle again and a lot of the same um, sort of insignia that he used with a local architect now, Albert Roller. And you really recognize the sheet style of these trees and horses. And by this time he knew who all of those historical uh, Masonic figures were and he did a fantastic job. But his uh, vision got even bigger than that. This is a picture of downtown Pomona in the 1950s. Uh, and later in the 50s, early 60s, this was when pedestrian malls were really sort of just in their heyday, just beginning to take off. And Millard Sheets uh, proposed to the city council of Pomona that they should revitalize their downtown by uh, blocking off nine blocks to traffic on Second Street and making it into a beautiful pedestrian mall with fountains and sculpture and with a elegant store buffins at one edge, one end of it. And that's exactly what he did. And you can go down there now and see it. It's, it's really beautiful and they keep it up very well. There were no people when I was there because of COVID, but uh, these beautiful mosaics and fountains, which they clean every week uh, by all of the different artists who were in his studio at that time, it's really lovely. And then he convinced Howard Amundsen to have another, uh, the first home savings tower anchoring one end of this. And if you look closely, you can see the H and the S linking here in these uh, grates over the windows. There's a, a big mosaic on the entryway. You can't go in that way anymore. And a huge long uh, mural on the inside. I just want to talk about a couple of the other projects he did that weren't home savings, but this is getting larger and larger and some of them are just wild. This is, he was approached uh, in the 60s by uh, Theodore Hesburgh, who was the chaplain at Notre Dame. They had built this brand new library and they said it looked like a grain elevator because there were no windows on the side and they wanted Millard Sheets to do a mosaic which he decided had to be done in granite because it needed to be able to, you couldn't use glass in that kind of a um, extreme weather environment. It's enormous, the head alone of Jesus there is nine feet tall and has 160 pieces of granite in it. Uh, it's called Word of Life and it was so large that he realized there was no way that they could see it on the ground when they had to lay it out. So they took it to a field and got bleachers, but even that wasn't tall enough. And he tells a story about having to climb up a nine story water tank in the winter and shimmy down on their bellies to look over the edge to make sure that this was all fitting together. It just sounds terrifying, worse than when he was in the war, but it worked. They put it up 
And because of its placement, they did not realize this, but you can apparently see it over the goalposts in the arena. It is now lovingly and always referred to as touchdown Jesus, which I think is great. He said he wished he'd used a helicopter to look at it. It just didn't occur to him. So that when he get a, got another project that was enormous, which was from um, the Hilton executives in Waikiki, and apparently the rainbow is the symbol of Hawaii. They wanted this rainbow uh, on their building. They didn't believe that he was going to be able to carry this out accurately. So he laid it out and hired a uh, helicopter. And it, there it still remains. These are 12 foot um, their uh, ceramic tiles. Entered a competition for the Detroit Public Library, another one for the Basilica of the National Shrine in Washington, DC, other projects. And here, one that I'm dying to see, but I can't get into, uh, the largest textile in North America, commissioned by them for their communication center. It took, it's an Aubusson ta tapestry from France that took seven weavers, two and a half years, like an inch a day to make this is kind of the history of communication. Although, I mean, I probably shouldn't say, it, but this looks a lot like Touchdown Jesus to me, but I'm dying to go and see this thing. It just is the most, like the idea that there's a textile that large. Okay, just a few other projects at the end here. They knocked down the NBC uh, NBC studios. This is at Hollywood and Vine. This was Millard Sheets' favorite project. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not exciting at the same level as the uh, Masonic Lodge, but he said this was one of his favorites. Uh, and they built a, this was one of the first themed ones that they did when they knocked down the NBC. It was a very iconic, beloved building. People were mad about it. They decided to devote this bank, the home savings, to the history of film because um, one of the early talkies was filmed in that studio. It was called Squaw Man. And if you go into this at Sunset and Vine today, which I hope you do, because it's just, it's wonderful to spend time there. They actually have four scenes from the movie painted in this, it's really hard to see the mural. Uh, but the mosaics around this building are, they're just hundreds of Hollywood stars. Some you recognize, some you don't. This is Betty Davis and um, Cooper and um, I mean, just everybody you can imagine, is in, including Zazu Pitts, who most people don't even know who that is anymore. But it's a wonderful, um, it's just a wonderful, lively, kind of campy place, I think. And the, the stained glass that Susan Hertel did uh, is meant to look like uh, film strips. And Millard Sheets came up with the idea of um, famous, uh, famous flight scenes of people like, you know, trying to run away and escape uh, all through the film. So that's Moby Dick, which I suppose counts as one. Just an, a project that is not an Amundsen bank. This is in uh, in Claremont and it was taken over later this by the US bank. This is an example of, um, I'm just gonna go over maybe five minutes. I hope that's okay. If not, I understand if you have to leave. Uh, when this was originally commissioned, this beautiful um, mosaic that you see there of Indians among the uh, yucca, when the bank, you know, almost 20 years later, decides that they're gonna build an ATM facility that you can drive through Dennis O'Connor who was in charge of the Millard Sheets uh, studio then, really just duplicates it on the side, which I think was a very sensitive way of handling it. But here's an example of what's happening to a lot of the Millard Sheets projects now because they're not landmarked, or at least this one in Santa Monica, which is an exact duplicate of the one in Anaheim. They're the same building, angled off the corner, um, slipped through the cracks. This was Pleasures Along the Beach, this very large uh, mosaic that was very popular. And uh, another scene of families was very typical for uh, the Amundsen projects. This was done by uh, Fenchy, Renzo Fenchy. So you see these from about the same time and designed in very much the same way. Only the one on the left uh, went into private ownership and it's now a New Balance store. And they immediately covered up their beautiful stained glass. I'm not sure why, whereas the one on the right, you can still see, even though it's harder to see it. And then they removed the uh, 
the that incredible mural, the mosaic. They actually removed the uh, sculpture too, and it's now a sculpture of a, a homeless man that went up in 2019. Now, luckily, Tony Sheets has been tracking all of the things that are happening to his father's work when they're being taken down or ruined. And that has been taken to uh, Chapman College, which is um, going to be open, installing it in their new museum. I think it's going to be in 2023. So we will get to see that again. But that's not always the case. Whereas the one on the right was this incredibly complex historical, it has 25 people in it and historical architecture. You know, I'm not sure why that was taken down. Other places have been very careful to preserve. There's this is an urgent care in Montebello, which hired a company to actually put in educational panels about Millard Sheets and, and what they have there. This is just a beautiful project. Um, one of the later ones that Millard Sheets worked on in uh, outside of Palos Verdes, just, you know, beautiful work worth just going and driving around and stopping at this place. When the last one that he worked on himself before he retired is in Encino, it was um, redone. There were actually other things there and then they redid it, but it's a beautiful one. It's got these incredible grills out in front that Tony Sheets um, helped create and uh, mosaics. And this was, I think the last piece that Millard Sheets actually signed this mural here um, before he, at that point retired in 1977, he was 70 years old and he really only wanted to be a painter. He had been trying to get out from under the company uh, for a long time and finally, you know, turned it over to two of his principals, Susan Hertel and Dennis O'Connor and just moved to a piece of property that he had built a home and studio on in Guilala, which is in uh, Mendocino County, north of San Francisco. Uh, and just painted for the rest of his life. He was always hooked in for like 20 years to taking these international trips with um, work, take, teaching workshops and painting. And you can see his style would be hard to even say what dates there were. These could have easily been earlier in his career. He just paints from, from or about different countries for the rest of his life. He had a fantastic life. He finally died at the age of 82 in Gualala. This is Barking Rocks as they named it because it's right on the coast, this primo piece of property. And um, this whole rock in front of it was filled with sea lions, which apparently made a cacophonous noise. And there's one right there. And that's where he died and where his ashes were spread in 1989. And uh, the Millard Sheets and Associates went on for a number of years, but eventually that you know, went its way too. And the two principals separated. One ended up in New Mexico, Susan Hertel. Dennis O'Connor stayed around California. But it's a fascinating period in uh, American art and in California art. And I'm really glad that I learned about it and could share it with you. <laughs> and that is the end. Thank you. <laughs> I, Phyllis, I think this was, Phyllis, that, you're oh. muted, Phyllis. I think Phyllis, she was talking, but whoever was speaking, feel free. Um, this was fabulous. I've known about him always, but never knew all that he did. I was kind of mostly familiar with his paintings, but this was spectacular. I just loved it. Especially I'm so glad to hear that because I was like freaking out. The oh, you're so time. fabulous. I, I just think it really was wonderful. I also love the way I've always pronounced it Millard and Chenard. And you have a much more sophisticated. No, I could be totally wrong. I, I don't even know. I, I can't remember. You know, how I, I've, I've it. always heard. I've always heard Millard sheets and Chenard uh, art. You're probably right. And but so I don't know. I like, the, that. I like the way you said it better. <laughs> you know, what do I know? I, I actually never even heard them. I was looking up. You pronounce, well, and we'll talk about that later, but thank you. I'm glad to know that. I, I think this was a spectacular presentation. Really <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, really. That means a lot to me. I'm My an artist, so I appreciate it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Victoria, this was spectacular. We haven't hardly lost a soul in our audience the whole time um wow good oh god i'm so glad like 
96 people here, I think, at the peak. And um, so I've got your chat is just full of a lot of um, not so many questions, but more um, comments just about personal experiences that people had and um, oh, memories. I, and I hope I can everybody is very engaged in all of this. So mm -hmm. it's uh, fascinating. We do have people here from the Hilbert museum hilbert i'm sorry it went right out of my <laughs> mind that's where that that's where this is going to be installed that wonderful pleasures along the beach right Monica. so i don't know if mary platt has been making some comments in here do you want to unmute yourself and talk for uh, 30 seconds or so and tell us about um where people can come and see more of this mary platt are you still i'm here okay hi yeah, I beautiful, beautiful presentation, Victoria. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mary. We're we're so pleased to have you know quite a few um, pieces by Millard in uh, Mark Hilbert's collection and in our collection, and uh, we have two of them up right now. We've got his uh, Hollywood Bowl uh, watercolor painting from 1956, and we also have a 1933 um, beautiful watercolor called San Dimas train station that's really one of our visitors favorites. Great. Um, and those are up currently in our Los Angeles area scene paintings uh, exhibition, which is up till June 26th. Um, I'm so glad to know that. Thank you. We're, we're so, so excited to have uh, participated in saving that wonderful mosaic from the uh, Santa Monica home saving, former home savings. Um, it's in storage right now in, in lots of pieces. Um, but, you know, so the challenge will be reconstructing it and, you know, laying it out and putting it back up on our facade, uh, which um, I'm sure that I'll be pitching to all the local news uh, stations when that happens, because it's, it's really a great story. And um, we also have, we also saved the sculpture program from that building. So we have- Oh, you did? Oh, have, I, didn't, I couldn't know. find that information. Yeah, we have them and they're in storage. So we'll be restoring those as well. So. Fantastic, thank you so much. It's good to know that. Yeah, so please everybody come to the Hilbert Museum if you haven't been here yet, free admission. Um, and you can check our website, hilbertmuseum.org. Thank you very much, Mary. That was great. I'm so glad you joined us. And um, we have um, several comments were here about um, the he drew fire. Uh, oh, yeah, they drew, been, they, they drew fire. Yeah, they drew fire that's uh, available on YouTube, I guess, in four segments. Oh, good, so good, good. Several people have commented on that. And then um, Let's see, what else do we want to share here? Uh, apparently in San Diego, there are some Millard sheets. Yes, um, there are. And they're endangered. They want to tear them down. And so there's a big uh, promotion here to save them. So hopefully that will happen. Um, yeah, those are beautiful, the ones in San Diego that I'm familiar with. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, we've lost a lot of them already, apparently. Mm. And I mean, really, the uh, the book by Adam Aronson, I can't, you know, say enough great things about him and his website and his information. Uh, but I don't know how involved he is now in trying, I mean, he can't be involved in saving them. He's not here, but we all need to work together to make, because they're just fantastic. There's nothing like them. How active are his children? Um, in... Well, Tony Sheets is very active. Um, I, I have not been in touch with any of them. I didn't know. Again, this was a project that I, you know, just got involved with on a whim of my own. And uh, there was a point where I thought, well, maybe I should get in touch with his daughter, um, Caroline, who is a Unitarian minister, I think in San Diego. Oh. And Tony, I'm not sure where he lives now, but he was an artist and he's been very, very active in helping to preserve these and trying to keep track of stuff. But it's really preservation societies and local groups that they're the, you know, they're the people that on the ground that really need to try and step in. It doesn't always work. It didn't work in Santa Monica. There was a big loophole and it, but you know, these, these don't have landmark status, most of them. Well, some late breaking news here. We just found out that uh, Tony Sheets had quadruple bypass surgery last week. 
and oh. is currently in the hospital, but hoping to go home this week. Oh, well, mm. good. Oh, I'm glad there's a friend of them. I mean, I was almost, you know, I wasn't sure that I, how accurate I was going to be with everything. So tell them that I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> he has a page on Caring Bridge. Um, Great. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Um, someone just wrote Millard Sheets Legacy Lives On Today in my New Mexico and Dallas Mosaic Studios. Long story, but I was able to purchase several thousand pounds of his original Italian small materials. Small tea. Yeah. Those are small the tea materials through an acquaintance of his wife, Mary. Today I'm using it in another facade mosaic for a Texas fire station. That's from Julie Ritchie. Fantastic. That's good to know. Oh, how great. This is really exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all the feedback and all the, we have some very uh, can you save that great group? audience. Yes, I think we can save the chat. Okay. Meredith will I would like tell to you how. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just too much to read it all because uh, it's quite amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm really glad. <laughs> And everybody who is a member, this is um, a benefit of membership to be able to see the archived recording. So you can watch this again. All members can, if they missed it, they can come and see it. And so another reason to join the eBell to be able to see our archived recordings over and over and over as many times as you wish. So I just wanna take a minute here. We're coming up on 1.30 already. So, um, we have two more programs this week. It's a big week for eBell programs. So on Wednesday, we are having a panel discussion from Camp Brave Trails, which is, um, let me get the initials in the correct order, L, um, LGBTQIA+, plus, I think, um, to educate us on all uh, from the camp on all of these different um, segments of our society and the young people who are growing up and going to this wonderful camp. And then on Friday, we are going to Tuscany live for Foodie Friday. <laughs> or it's a combination of food program and anybody who loves to travel is going to enjoy this just as much, even if you don't cook, just if you like to eat. <laughs> so we're going to learn to make homemade pasta from scratch without the benefit of a pasta maker, but we will also see this beautiful part of Tuscany up above Lucca um, and visit this couple who, the, who are going to cook, who live in a very ancient villa. And they will show us around the villa and show us some of the special features. So it's going to um, close out May for us. And anyway, we hope you'll all come back. And thank you, Victoria. This is just amazing. And thank you so much. Next time, Step Wells of India. Yes, we do <laughs> want to hear about this. We know. Yes. <laughs> so maybe you can come back live in our club for us when we when we are able to open again. Boy, that would fall. be better than this. Yeah, looking forward to that program on the Step Wells. Yes. Oh, I. Uh, that's my friend Pushpa here, who's on the the show. I recognize your voice, Pushpa, who is, uh, <laughs> yeah. who I met in India. Oh, wonderful. Great. <laughs> Guys, so, anyway. can, can Mark Hilbert say hello? He just stopped in. And Oh, great. Sure. Mark, you want to get on camera here? Sure. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, Marty. I love what you're doing here. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I look this... forward to uh, having more communication. Uh, yes. When, we, when it gets closer to the time of opening the museum, uh, we'll have this mural up and we'll really uh, want to have somebody come and talk about it. So it'd be fantastic. <laughs> we're, we're looking for speakers, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Tony Sheets isn't available, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hope he's well and he's the person to ask. Yeah. I'm an interloper at this point. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for saving all of these for us, so for the future. Okay, I think I'm going to.
close Bye, this out. everybody. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.